Bella led us eagerly down the path, never faltering, steering us deftly around rocks and roots and fallen branches. I'd lost the flashlight in the confusion and was grateful for the dog's sure footing. All the way down Brewster's Hill, neither Celine nor I said one word. We didn't look behind us for fear of what might be following us. Every noise made my heart pound. I thought I heard Bloody Bones snuffle, heard his hooves on the stones, smelled his hot, bloody breath, thought he was getting closer, closer. Soon he'd have us both, and Bella, too. But when we came out of the woods at the bottom of Brewster's Hill, Bloody Bones was not behind us after all. Or, if he had been, he wasn't there then. I paused and took a deep breath. Here on the edge of the field, with the house inside, I felt almost safe. Bella licked my hand and wagged her tail. I watched her trot off toward Bro Brody's house, sad to see her leave. Celine's cold hand touched mine now. She'd been crying silently. I got no one now, she whispered. Her voice was like a song you hear in the dark just before you fall asleep. I squeezed her hand and felt its tiny bones shift in my grip. People were so fragile, so easily broken, so hard to put back together. Mr. and Mrs. O'Neill will take care of you, I told her. Celine said nothing, but she let me lead her across the field toward the farmhouse. The back porch light lit the yard like a spotlight. Before I opened the door, Dad threw it wide. Where have you been, he shouted. Aren't we worried enough without your going off somewhere without a word to anybody? His eyes lit on Celine. Is this the girl your mother was talking about? I nodded and squeezed Celine's cold hand. She ran away and I went to find her. Mom came into the kitchen, followed by the O'Neills. Looking at Celine with hostility, Mom said, she took the doll with her and she's wearing your clothes, Daniel. Now, Martha, Mrs. O'Neill patted Mom's shoulder in an effort to calm her. What have I been telling you? Nothing, I believe. Mom never took her eyes off Celine. What's your name? Girl. Celine lowered her head. She was so pale and so little and so skinny. How could Mom be so mean to her? Mom scowled down at Celine. Your real name. Tell me your real name. Tell me who you are. I'm his sister now. Mom seemed too son to speak, but Dad said, You're not my son's sister. That's what Auntie said, Celine whispered. I'm to be his sister now, to take the place of the other. Before Mom or Dad could say no more, Mr. O'Neill knelt down beside Celine and studied her face. I knew you a long time ago, Celine. You lived right here in this house. You were friends with my daughter, Eleanor. I knew your parents, too. Do you remember my wife and me? I never lived here, Celine told Mr. O'Neill, obviously confused. I don't have no mama or daddy, no friends either. I've lived my whole life long with Auntie, but she don't want me anymore. Pointing at me, she added, Auntie says I'm to be his sister now, and it, I'll be hurt if I come back to the cabin looking to be with her again. I can't take this anymore. Mom left the kitchen and clattered up the back stairs. We all heard our bedroom door slam shut. It was just like before, only this time she didn't take the doll. Will you please tell me what's going on, Daniel? Dad asked. I did my best to explain it, but I knew I was losing him. He kept interrupting and saying, This is ridiculous. Do you expect me to believe you? Mr. O'Neill sighed. I tried to tell you, Ted. Dad turned his back and followed Mom upstairs. The O'Neill, Celine, and I were left in the kitchen. I had no idea what to say or do. Mrs. O'Neill sat down and lifted Celine into her lap. The girl leaned into Mrs. O'Neill and pressed her face against the woman's body. Little Erica stared over her shoulder, her blank blue eyes focused on nothing. Do you remember anything about this house, Mrs. O'Neill asked Celine? Your mama or your daddy? Celine shook her head. I've been telling you and telling you. I'm Auntie's girl. But not any more, Mrs. O'Neill said. Celine didn't say anything. She's almost asleep, poor thing, Mr. O'Neill murmured. How about we take her to our house, Mrs. O'Neill asked me, as if she expected me to make the decision. The very sight of her upsets your mother and angers your father. Maybe that would be best, I said. I found a spare blanket and gave it to Mr. O'Neill. He wrapped it around Celine and carried her out to the car. I stood on the back porch, shivering in the cold. Just make sure she doesn't run off, I called. She'll, she'll free to, freeze to death in those woods. Don't worry, Mr. O'Neill said. We'll keep her safe. Come on, see us tomorrow, Mrs. O'Neill added. I've got things to talk about with you. I watched the car turn and head down the driveway. When its tail lights disappeared around a curve, I went back inside. I was so tired, so, so tired, so sad. My head ached as if my brain were about to explode from trying to understand what I'd seen in the woods. It couldn't be true. It was true. It couldn't be. It was. The next morning, I woke up early, ate breakfast, and left a note telling Mom and Dad I was at the O'Neill's house. It was cold, and the sky was a solid light gray, so heavy with clouds that the sun couldn't break through. It felt as if snow was coming. 
Maybe it was better to think of Erica being with old Auntie than to imagine her wandering around the woods, lost and cold and hungry. I saw Brody at the end of our driveway. He was wearing a suede jacket and a pair of filthy pink tennis shoes with holes in the, sh in the toes. Bella was with him, trotting along the edge of the road and sniffing the weeds. When she saw me, she ran up and wagged her tail. Did you go to the cabin? Brody asked. Was Celine there? I looked up from petting Bella and nodded. She swore Erica was inside, but all I saw were ruins, looking just like they always have. Did you see old Auntie? I was never so scared in my whole life. She's, she's, I couldn't say any more for fear of somehow bringing her to me. Wiping his nose on the sleeve of his jacket, Brody stared at me. What did she do? What did she say? She told me to take Celine home. She said she's my sister now. That girl doesn't want to be your sister, Brody spat on the ground. She wants to be with Auntie, but Auntie says that if Celine comes near the cabin, she'll sick bloody bones on her. Brody's eyes widened. Did you see him? I stared off into the woods and tried not to think about what I'd seen. He's horrible, just like you said. Did he chase you? No. He stood there and looked at us, and then old Auntie whistled for him. Brody sucked in his cheeks and let his air, let his breath out in a puff of air. You must be really brave or really stupid. I'm not sure which, but I'm glad you bring my dog home safe. With Bella between us, we stood on the edge of the road for a while, staring at the, at the trees as if we were expected to see bloody bones or old Auntie. 